Hi, I'm Pastor Bill Thomas. It's another weekend message, and uh, I'm excited about today's message because it's something we all deal with, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Just want to let you know some things are happening here at uh, Hereford Faith and Life Church uh, in Moncton, Maryland. On August 6th, we have a great family play night. It's going to be uh, kind of themed after the Olympics, and it's for elementary school children, their families, and it'll be just a fun night outside, uh, lots of games, and uh, we're just going to make it a, a, a great night. So put that on your calendar. Uh, in October, uh, we also have a hymn sing. I'll talk more about that as we get closer. Uh, all this will be on our website, herefordumc.com. And uh, I hope you are checking those out. I also want to thank you, too, for your gifts. Uh, some of you are not part of our church family, but you're watching these videos. I just want to encourage you, you know, first give to your local church. That's really important. But uh, your gifts and your generosity towards us will really help us keep our ministries and missions alive and well as we are not looking back. Uh, you know, COVID, everybody experienced that, but we're not looking back. We're not, we're not going back. We're looking forward. And uh, that forward attitude is going to keep us moving and ministering to people. And uh, again, our, our mission statement, in case you have not uh, heard it or seen it on our website, is that we want to love, encourage, and empower people to experience faith and life in Jesus Christ. That, that's what we're all about. Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. He's the uh, most important, uh, very center of who we are, what we do. And we exalt him and his work on the cross for us that saved us and uh, heaven's ours because of him. So uh, he has preeminence in our church. We're also a church that focuses on the word of God. We, we are Bible believing people. And uh, in the midst of that, we are also called to love. And, and it's not uh, on either end of the spectrum. Uh, Bible believing people are the most loving people. And I uh, want to encourage you, if you're in the area, to come and check us out. Uh, right now, we're meeting live in our Family Life Center at uh, 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. But, you know, if, again, if you're distanced or you're, you've got some health uh, compromises, I'm glad you're part of this online family. We're not going to forget you. And we're going to keep this up even as we move forward. In fact, our plans are, and things are on order, is that we'll begin at some point in time live streaming our services so you won't get this recorded message. You'll be able to actually to sit in live to our worship, or later you can watch it uh, recorded. But uh, that's our plans, and we're happy and glad you're part of it. So you might want to have your Bibles ready, a notebook, because the, the notes I think you're going to really appreciate uh, today as we talk about stress. But first, let's uh, let's pray, and then I'll share screen with you, and we'll get on the message. Heavenly Father, thank you for this incredible day. Thank you for your love, which is unfathomable. How you love us is just beyond our, our wildest dreams, and uh, we are so captured by your love, and we just willingly lay down our lives for you uh, in submission to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of that great love and your grace that you extend to us, grace that covers all of our sins and mercy, how you extend that to us. So we're grateful, God. We pray now, Holy Spirit, come and teach us through your word and be with each one of us in our needs. I know that there are people uh, who are ill. There are people looking at surgeries. There are people struggling with finances. There are people struggling with relational issues. God, you are more than able and more than willing to uh, work on our behalf. And so we pray where we lift them up to you. And we just now await to hear what you have for us. Help us not to look at this message as something for somebody else. Help us apply it ourselves. Jesus said, blessed if you are not, be not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And, and we, we want to be blessed people. And we thank you. We already are in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. So as I was sharing with you, we are going to uh, share screen here uh, in a moment. And I want you to look at uh, where we are uh, and what we'll be looking at. Here we go. We're going to be talking about how to think biblically about stress. You know, that's really, really important. God tells us in the 12th chapter of Romans to don't let the world squeeze uh, you into its mold, but be transformed, transformed into disciples, into Christ followers by the renewing of our mind. 
And so real transformation, of course, is done by the Holy Spirit. It's when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. But we have a part to play in this transformation, and that is we need to renew our minds. We need to renew the way we think. We need to be in thinking biblically about the issues of life. We, we need to be looking at from God's perspective on the issues of life and not the way we used to, not our point of view, but God's point of view. And so far in this series, we've looked at how to think about our problems from God's point of view, and we all have them. I hope you go back and, and uh, look at that message, take some notes and uh, apply it. We also looked about our relationships. That's so important that we think about our relationships from God's point of view, not, not our point of view. And last week, we looked at God's perspective on changing our hearts. You know, we often think, can I really change? We need to see change from God's perspective. And folks, it's all about, again, renewing our minds. Well, today we're going to look at how we think biblically about stress, right? How, how do we have God's perspective about the stress in our lives? Now, uh, if I were, uh, could see you, uh, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you've ever experienced stress in your life. Okay. Now, I'm sure everybody's got their hand. In fact, now I could, I could ask how many of you, in fact, right now, you're under a great amount of stress and there'd be a lot of people with hands up. Well, don't, don't feel ashamed about that. It's, we, we all experience stress. The Mental Health Foundation defines stress as the feeling of being overwhelmed or unable to cope with mental and or emotional pressures. Now, according to the uh, Mental Health Foundation, stress is a normal reaction. We know that. It happens to everyone. In fact, the MHF goes on to say that our bodies were created with certain stress responses that are beneficial to us, such as the well-known fight or flight syndrome, right? And that's for our survival. But we all know that too much stress is harmful. Again, according to the Mental uh, Health Foundation, stress can become a critical health problem when we go without periods of relief and relaxation from stress. So stress can become destructive physically, emotionally, and yes, even spiritually. So let's just ask some questions. So what stresses you out, right? There's a whole list of them there on the screen. Not enough time in the day to get everything done. Not enough of you to spread around, right? Relational conflicts, marital problems, problems with kids, pressures, trauma, chronic illness, politics. That's not even on that list. I mean, I tell you, it's been a stressful uh, political time and season. These past year, two years, uh, it's been really tough. World problems, but like COVID, talk about health issues, COVID, a worldwide pandemic. And you might be thinking about future retirement. These are all major stressors in everybody's lives. But for Christians, there's a couple of them that usually don't make the list. I just want to touch base on them because they're important to have on our radar. First, when Christians are asked to compromise our values, whenever we're in a situation where we know we, we are compromising what we hold to be a real biblical conviction, well, that just is incredibly stressful. It really is. It's the same uh, uh, stress uh, living with known sin in your life. And that, that's, we, we know our, that's what our conscience is about. It's, it's, our conscience is screaming, and, and, but we, we keep doing this behavior, and it just causes immense stress. I remember uh, that I experienced that in a huge way my uh, senior year of college. You know, my sophomore year, I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And it was a radical uh, conversion and change. And, uh, and it took me all the way through into my senior year. I, I was a Christian. I, I was going to Bible study uh, secretly. I was going to chapel every Sunday, but I was also elected president of my fraternity, which uh, I could describe about a bunch of great guys, but it was uh, that's how they based the movie Animal House on. So if you can picture that as president, uh, I had to live a pretty wild lifestyle that represented who we were to the rest of the people on campus. Well, and, and listen, all the time inside of me, I knew that what I was doing was wrong. I was grieving God, and it really, really stressed me out. It was a terrible uh, time of stress. And so, you know, we all have stuff that can be a stressor, but, uh, and there's amount of stuff, a certain amount of stress that we can handle, but not over and over again and again and again. I like in stress, I got a picture, I used to uh, lifeguard at pools and coach swim teams during the summer to pay my way through, through college. And so I kind of grew up at pools and 
But stress is like treading water in the deep end of the pool, in the diving well where you can't touch and trying to hold down a beach ball. We used to do that for fun with our swim teams because it, it really is exhausting. You can do it, but it takes a lot of muscle, takes a lot of work, a lot of stamina. And that's the way people live their lives sometimes. You can handle stress, but man, it is, it's costly to you. But imagine now someone throwing two or three or four or five beach balls and trying to keep them all underwater. Uh, it, it's impossible. It, no matter how great a swimmer you are, no matter how strong you are, you can't do it. And, and this is what stress does. What starts as a mere concern, right? It just kind of creeps into your radar screen. Eventually, if we don't do something about it, causes stress. And when you experience chronic stress, that's just like the red engine light going off in your car. You know, something's wrong with your engine. Well, this is a chronic stress is a red engine light that something is not right in your spirit or your soul, maybe even in your body. It's a danger signal that something is wrong in how we are looking and thinking and managing the issues of life. Again, I love Joyce Meyer's uh, expression that she uses. It's called stinking thinking. And, and that's exactly what happens when we, when, when we are thinking unbiblically, when we are thinking not the word of God and not what God says, but we're thinking these stinking thoughts that's when we get in deep, deep trouble, pain, and it can be really destructive to our lives. Now, if you've ever watched Dr. Oz or maybe Oprah years ago, there's lots of remedies for stress management. They're in about every magazine because so many people suffer from stress. Things like take good care of your bodies, exercise, proper diet, rest, staying positive, setting goals, priorities, connecting with people who make you feel calm. and happy. These are all things that we should be doing, it, but, but I want to even go deeper than that. How should we think about stress? I mean, what is God's perspective about chronic stress? Now, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise that one of the most effective ways to manage stress is meditation. And that is simply getting away in a quiet place, settling down your racing thoughts, and just focus in on things that are pleasant and calming. And you might be thinking, oh, geez, Bill, should Christians meditate? I mean, I thought that was New Age stuff. That was Eastern religious stuff. Well, listen, meditation is found throughout the Bible. That's, that's a, a Christian concept. And listen, Christianity is an Eastern religion. So over and over again, the Bible tells us, God's word, that we need to meditate. Meditate on God. Meditate on his virtues of love and kindness and greatness. We're told to meditate on God's word, to really focus in and let that word get deep into our soul and into our thought processes. I love Psalm 1, the very first book of songs that David writes. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or set foot on the path of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and who prospers in all he does. Listen, meditation for a Christian is essential, as it was in the Old Testament for the ancient Jew. We are to focus and center our thoughts upon God and upon his word. Psalm chapter 77, verse 12 says, I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Now, I'm not talking about getting into a set of leotards and lighting some candles and incense and crossing your legs and saying some meaningless mantra over and over again, all right? I know that people do that, but Christian meditation is simply sitting quietly, maybe in your favorite chair, maybe in a, a, a favorite place outside, your Bible in your lap, and intentionally focusing your thoughts on God and his word, pushing everything aside. I'm not talking about making your mind blank, all right? That's dangerous. No, it's thinking and focusing, uh, meditating on God and his word. It might be just a quality. On, on one day, you might just meditate on the love of God. You might find a verse and just think each word through and let it minister to your spirit. So it's really important. And it's one of the key things. And again, it, we're talking about renewing our minds. Meditating is thinking, thinking the way God thinks, 
meditating on God, meditating on his word. It's really uh, something. See, two people can go through the exact same stresses. One's at wit's end, ready to throw in a towel. The other is calmly going through life with a smile. How come? It's because one person is obsessively thinking about their problems, and the other is taking time to meditate and think upon God and his word. He, he or she is renewing their mind. One is staring at the problems. The other is focused on the one who can solve the problems. So when things get stressful, what, what does God want me to focus my thoughts on? You know, what, do, what do I need to meditate on? Well, here's the first thing. We want to meditate and focus on God's sovereignty. This is one of the most important fundamentals of biblical theology of who God is. God is sovereign. It's foundational to our faith. What that means is simply God is king. He reigns over his creation. He reigns over the universe. Psalm chapter 47, verses 6 through 9. Read it with me. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king over all the earth. Praise him with a psalm. God reigns above the nations, sitting on his holy throne. See, that's talking about the sovereignty, the rulership of God. Now, how will that calm us when we're stressed? Well, the fact that God is sovereign and king over all the earth means that at all times and in all circumstances, God is in control. Nothing is spinning out of control. Nothing is happening to you that hasn't been sifted through his uh, will and his purposes for you. God is sovereign. He rules over everything in the universe. The song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He does. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every person. He has you in his hands. In Psalm 11, uh, David writes, he's, he's talking about all the stresses and calamities in his world, the issues he's facing. And it's pretty amazing. Here's what he writes. He says, I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? Sounds a lot like our culture, doesn't it? Everything's getting turned upside down violence in the streets, violence towards those who are righteous. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt like the world's against you, problem after problem, aiming the arrows of stress and worry at your heart? Here's the answer. David writes, Psalm chapter 11, verse 4, but the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. He watches everyone closely examining every person on the earth. In other words, no matter how stressful and chaotic the world is around you, God is still on his throne ruling from heaven. He's in control. Your life might look out of control, but here's what you need to meditate upon. Focus on God's sovereignty. He is in control. He's in control. And you know what that means? That means he doesn't need our help, right? We get stressed out. When we think we're God and we feel like we need to fix everything and fix every person and right every wrong, we, we, we think we're superhuman. People, we're not. We're, we're not God. We have limitations. So stop playing God. That will eliminate a lot of stress in your life. Stop trying to fix everything and control everything. You're going to be a much happier and calmer person when you focus on God's rulership and God's sovereignty. But that's why it's so important for us to know God's plan and purpose for our lives. So we're not stressed out and focused on all these other things just meant to wipe us out. We need a clear direction of where we're going. And God will do that. God will give us his plan. God's in control of your life. He has a plan and purpose custom made for you. And it's a good plan. And it's a great destiny. And nothing can come into your life that is not passed through the filter of God's love for you and his eternal plan for your life. I think that's so important for you to understand. The good, the bad, the ugly. God is there controlling in your life. And you're saying, but I, don't, I feel like things are out of control. Well, that's because you're not in charge. God has it well in hand. God, I want to tell people in those stressful times, God's not walking the portals of heaven, wringing his hands and worried, oh my, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? No, God is in control. He knows everything. 
He knows the past, the present, the future. He knows what's going to happen. He's in control. I love the old Don Moen song. God will make a way when there seems like there's no way. He works in ways we cannot see. God will make a way for me. That's just echoing Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where God says all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. In other words, even the rough and tough and painful situations in our life that cause so much stress, God can handle them. He's sovereign and he can turn it into good. And you might say, well, Bill, why would God do such a thing? Because he loves you. He loves you so much. Jesus is sharing Matthew chapter 10, and he says, what's the price of two sparrows? One, one copper coin, a penny? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're more valuable than a whole flock of sparrows. In other words, <laughs> you are so valuable to God. He loves you so much. And listen, even when you feel worthless, God values you immensely. He loves you. In fact, he loves you enough to have sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you. So when troubles and trials, all the things that stress us out come into our lives, if we will think of those things from God's sovereign point of view, they won't stress us out anymore. In fact, what will happen is what we read about in James chapter 1. James writes, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If we will meditate and focus and think upon the sovereignty of God, that he's in total control of every situation, we don't have to stress out. We don't have to lose sleep with worry and anxiety. In fact, if we look at what stresses us out from God's perspective, we can joyfully thank God for what we're going to learn through this struggle or how we'll grow through these tough situations that life throws at all of us. So we're not denying our troubles. We're just seeing them from God's point of view. So the first thing we need to do when stress comes is focus, meditate on God's sovereignty. He's in control. Secondly, I need to take... Uh, uh, every concern, the, the, the moment I'm aware of it, the moment it comes on my radar screen, and go to God in prayer and trust him, even in the smallest needs. So this is how we need to think. When, when See, stress starts first with a concern. It pops up on our radar screen. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, gosh, I'm, looks like we may be a little short this month from my salary and my bills. And if we don't stop right there and give that concern to God in prayer. That concern grows into a worry, and that worry grows into a stressor, and stressors have a way of worming their way into all of our thoughts and lives, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Listen, what keeps us from giving God our, our simple needs and concerns when they show up? It, 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 God cares about every need. God cares about every concern because he loves us. Matthew chapter 6, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus meticulously outlines all the things we stress and worry about in life. And you know what he tells us to do? He says, stop it. Your Father in heaven knows we need all these things, and he loves you, and he'll provide for you. I love verse 26, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Someone once told me that worries like a rocking chair. You, you keep very, very busy, but you don't go anywhere. Besides, 90 plus percent of what we worry about never happens. This is such a critical verse. Please write it down. Well, there's that verse from uh, Jesus of Matthew. Look at the birds. They don't plant, but aren't you far more valuable to him. Here's a verse you need to write down on a card, put it on your refrigerator or on your mirror or somewhere. Let's read it together. Cast all your cares, and that means your anxieties, your burdens, your worries, your stressors upon the Lord, for he cares for you. You want to know how dumb we are? We actually train ourselves to not trust God. 
And we all do it. A small need or concern pops up, and it's so small. We don't even think about praying about it because we can handle it. And we do. Eventually, a couple needs and concerns pop up. And again, we don't take them to God or trust him to handle it because we can handle it ourselves. I mean, we're smart. We, we, we're, we're creative. And we're kind of proud that we can do it. We're, we're multitasking with the best of them. And we do this again and again. And remember the beach balls? We find ourselves eventually, we can't hold them all down. We are stressed out with a flood of worries and fears and situations we can't handle. Every day, we feel like we're drowning in a tsunami of stress. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to meditate on. Here's what we need to think about. You take every need, every care, every burden, every worry, the moment it presents itself, the moment it pops into your thoughts and stop right then and there and give it to God in prayer and trust him to deal with it. See, we're not able to live this life without God. No one is. Only God is able. God is able to take care of every single need and care and burden that you and I have. But listen, God's not only able, God is willing. He wants us to depend on him for every need and concern. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. You know, James wrote in his epistle, we have not because we ask not. In other words, if we don't pray, if we don't give it to God, God's not going to move. One of the things we learned about this uh, COVID season, we did our 40 days of prayers that we can go to God every day with the issues of life that are knocking on our door. And we can give them to God and trust him with our concerns, trust him with our needs. And we can experience peace, peace that the world can't give, but only the peace that Jesus Christ can give. So listen, take your thoughts Take those little concerns, take those needs the moment they come into your life and learn, think, trust them to God. Take them to God in prayer. And what's going to happen is that will become a holy habit of taking it to God in prayer. It'll become a holy habit of casting all your cares and anxieties and burdens and worries and stressors upon the Lord. And we need that holy habit. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Well, how can we do that? I tell you why, by giving our today to God, every need, every concern, each and every day. All right, then we need to focus and, and meditate on this fact. We are never alone. We're not alone in this mess. So many times we think, uh, you know, I, I am all by myself. I'm isolated. You're not. You're not alone. First, remember that God is with you, right? God is with you. One of the classic symptoms and thought patterns of a person overwhelmed with chronic stress is they think they're alone in the struggle and there's no one who can help them. They, they feel like I'm the only person in the world that's struggling like this. And it's a feeling of despair and hopelessness that multiplies the impact of what's causing the stress. Isaiah writes in his uh, uh, book, Fear Not. This is God speaking, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Listen, God is our refuge and strength, it says in Psalm 46.1, a very present help in trouble. Hebrews chapter 13.6 says, we can say this with confidence. The Lord is my helper. I have nothing to fear. God is our helper. God is our comforter. God is our advocate. These, these are all names for the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we can come boldly to God's throne of grace in our time of need because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And Jesus said himself, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. You can take that to the bank. If you think back uh, several weeks ago, Joel Mason uh, shared a the message with us while I was recuperating from my hip surgery. And he told her the account of Jesus and the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. A violent storm blew in. And remember, it looked like they were all going to die. And all the disciples, who most of whom were hardened fishermen, they panicked, they feared for their lives. Where was Jesus? Jesus was at the bottom boat. He was just sleeping, sleeping during the height of this deadly, raging storm. And the disciples just couldn't take it any longer. They woke him up. Master, don't you care that we're all going to die? Don't you care that we're perishing? 
And Jesus just woke up and rebuked the storm. He just said, be still. And immediately it was, it was over. And he looked at him and said, where's your faith? You remember Joel's key point? Jesus was in the boat with the disciples. No matter how violent that storm would have gotten, they were safe and cared for because Jesus was with them. The one who has the power to calm the angry seas and the storms. And see, here's the deal. If you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart and life, then he's in the boat with you. All the storms and issues of life, no matter how stressful, will not kill you, will not harm you because Jesus is in your boat. He's with you. You're not alone. You're with the one who speaks and the storms grow calm. And the problem we have with our thinking about stress is that we focus on the problem, the issue, the circumstance. And that's what the disciples did. They focused on the storm around them. They focused on the raging uh, wind and the angry seas. What we need to do is focus and meditate and think upon him who is able to calm the storms. We need to keep our thoughts and our eyes and our focus on Jesus Christ. So we're never alone in the storm. Jesus is right there with us. But here's the icing to the cake, I think, that you know, if we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, we were born into God's family. So not, ever, not only is Jesus with us, so are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that great? We have Jesus and we have each other. I love uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. It talks about this advantage we have when we are united in Christ with brothers and sisters. It says if two people, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. And see, that's the problem. When we are isolated from the body of Christ, we get in trouble. We're alone. Likewise, though, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. There you go. The storms, the attacks of stress on our life. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Let me say this right to you. People of God, we have each other. It's the lone ranger, the lone wolf types that stay isolated, that don't need anybody who get in a terrible mess with stress. Folks, we're not designed or created by God to carry the stresses of life alone. We were made to live together in a covenant community called the body of Christ. As we share the load together and learn how to live a new life, a new way under the loving lordship of Jesus Christ as God's forever family. A new life, a new way under the loving lordship of Jesus Christ as God's forever family. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 37, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. See, we, each of us are vital parts of this body, and we need each other. We are eternally connected together, and we are called to help each other, care for each other, pray for one another. Verse 26 of that 1 Corinthians 12 reads, if one part suffers, well, all the parts suffer. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. In 1977, Richard Gilliard wrote a song. I know it really touched me because I really was living this Lone Ranger type Christianity. I didn't think I really needed the church, my brothers and sisters in Christ. He wrote this song. It impacted me very deeply. It's called The Servant Song. Let me just read the lyrics to you. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are brothers on the road, and we are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you, in the nighttime of your fear, and I will hold my hand out to you and speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I'll share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony, born of all we've known together of Christ's love and agony. Well, I can't have say it any better than that. Remember, you're never alone in all these struggles and stresses of life. Jesus is in your boat, and your church family is here 
to help you carry the load. Finally, listen, when all is said and done, we must focus and meditate on the fact that this world is not our home. I, I know we, we, we are so uh, uh, bent. on We live as if this is not true, but it is true. The, the, the song, I just read the lyrics, we're pilgrims on a journey. Pilgrims, this is not our home. We're, we're pilgrims on a journey. Listen, I am proud to be an American. I'm proud to be an American citizen. But when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I became a citizen of a higher kingdom. Heaven, the kingdom of God. And people that we often don't live like it, we don't belong to this world. We really don't. That's why it's wrong for us to want what this world wants and to accumulate more of this world because we're just passing through. We will live forever with God throughout eternity because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and our sins have been forgiven. We have new life in him, but this is not our home. And we have to remember this. Philippians chapter three, verse 20 through 21. Read it with me. But our citizenship is in heaven. Boy, circle that, underline it. That's so important. This world's not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, remember, God is sovereign, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. In other words, made for eternity. That's where we need to focus on, folks. We, we, we can get so stressed out because of this world that's just decaying and falling apart. And no, we're not to hide away. We're to be salt and light and do the best we can to, to change this world for Christ. But here's the bottom line. This world's not our home. Heaven's our home. The king of God is our home. And I can tell you this, one day, this world and all that's in it will be gone. And there's a day coming when one last person will say yes to Jesus Christ and history as we know it will end because Jesus Christ will come again and there'll be a new creation, a new heaven and earth. But we folks, we will not come to an end. Our home is in heaven with God forever and ever. Uh, you want to meditate on something? Meditate on this. Revelation chapter 21, one through seven. What is this new world? What is heaven going to be like? Read with me. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Is there any weeping here in the earth? Are you missing a loved one? Wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, the Lord Jesus Christ, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And to all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. I will be their God and they will be my children. Can I tell you something, people? There's nothing, nothing that compares to heaven and our glorious future in Christ. No matter the difficulties, no matter the trials, no matter the stresses in your life, it's, it'll be just for a moment. It will be temporary in the light of eternity. So when stress comes visiting, meditate upon these truths, right? Renew your mind with God's word and with God's virtues. Listen, flood your heart with them. Think about the sovereignty of God, right? We can trust God with the smallest concern. So, so give them to God immediately when they come. And think upon this. You're, you're never alone. God is with you. And so are your brothers in Christ. And then finally, remember this world is not your home, right? Well, folks, let, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. And again, thank you for this word. And God, I pray for those who are right now suffering under chronic stress. Would you just reach out your mighty hand, come to them with your comforting Holy Spirit and, and be their helper and guide. And Lord, help us renew our mind. 
help us not to think of these things from worldly perspectives, but from your perspective. And God, if there's anyone watching or listening and they've not yet given their life to Christ and they don't know that heaven's their home, uh, Lord, just right now, let it happen for them. All you have to do, folks, is just pray a simple prayer that you would ask God to forgive you for your sins because of what Jesus did in the cross. Believe that Jesus was uh, rose from the grave, God's eternal yes to the sacrifice of the cross, and that you will put your full trust in him and live for him all the days of your life. He will be your Lord. That's a, an old uh, King James word for it. he'll be your president, your CEO, your boss. He'll be the one calling the shots in your life. And I tell you what, it will be a blessed life because God himself will take up residence in you through his Holy Spirit. But you can pray that simple prayer. Lord, I give you my heart the best I know how, and I want to live for you and trust you each day of my life until I'm home with you in heaven. And we just pray that for you. We pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, I, I hope you've gotten something out of this message today. Uh, it's something that uh, not only can you walk through, but you can share it with others with neighbors or friends, family members who are just being totally stressed out. So, so just take them there. They can watch this video again. Are you, it's better when you share it, share how, how you have done these things, how we have renewed your mind and how now you're thinking biblically from God's perspective about stress. All right. Well, listen, the peace of Christ be with you. And it's a peace that only he can give when we're resting in him, calm, assured that God is in control, right? Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. His face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be blessed, guys. God bless. Thank you.